Hello, good morning everyone. I uh, hope you're well and looking forward to this episode of Learn with Lorna, which is the 69th in the series, uh, looking at the collection of Sinclair Mackay, Mr. Football. Is everyone well? What kind of weather have you got? Always like seeing what the weather is around the country in the first few comments. It's very grey here after a week of glorious, glorious sunshine. So yeah, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. My name is Lorna Steele. I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service, as those of you who watch regularly will know, uh, has four offices across uh, the Highlands which look after historic documents uh, and current documents relating to life in the Highlands. We have the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, we have uh, Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archive in Wick, Lochaber Archive Centre in Fort William and Sky and Lochalsh Archive Centre in Portree. Before I start talking about this week's um, subject, a reminder, as those of you who watch regularly will be used to, uh, that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, um, either th through a, a, a financial donation on our website or through a donation of collections that tell the story of the Highlands that you think meet, uh, merit being kept uh, for long term in our collections, then, then we very much appreciate all of that. This week I'm continuing the theme that we've started looking at this month of uh, sport and leisure and we're looking this week at one of the UK's biggest sporting obsessions, football. And across uh, the Highland Archive Service we hold several collections relating to football, an extensive uh, collection in Inverness of uh, cuttings, photos, reports and programmes, correspondence and so on related to Inverness Caledonian Thistle and uh, various incarnations uh, of that team as uh, the teams that came before it. But today we're looking particularly at a collection that's held in Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness archives, the Sinclair, uh, Sinclair Mackay uh, Mr Football collection. And I'll say right now, if I say Sinclair MacDonald, that's because that's another collection held in Nucleus, so I will attempt to always say Sinclair Mackay. <laughs> Um, this collection dates from 1899 up until 1956 and it was deposited with us just in 2019, so uh, just before the world uh, went a little bit mad. The collection comprises a variety of items relating to football in the county of Caithness. For instance, uh, minutes and accounts and income books of the Wick Harmsworth Park Improvements Committee, um, which is a, a sporting ground on the outskirts of Wick. Papers of Caithness Football Association, including uh, minutes and player registration forms and so on. The player registration forms within the Caithness Football Association relate to a huge range of teams, including uh, Wick Academicals, Thurzo Pentland, Thurzo Swift, Wick John O'Groats, uh, more commonly known as Wick Groats, Livester Portland, Thurzo Academicals and Wick Thistle. So a real um, large number of, of teams represented. The minutes uh, of the Wick Football Association are also in this collection and the minutes of the Wick John O'Groats Football Club, as I say, the Wick Groats. Um, I'm seeing uh, people there in Wick, so I'm sure if if you've got anything to add about the teams or, or anything I say, please do uh, uh, add that in. Before I come on to talk more about this collection and about Sinclair Mackay in particular, who's the man responsible for collecting and, and this, this collection, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background on the story of football in Scotland. So, like so many places, football was, has been played in some form for, for centuries. Um, I think the, it seems that the basic form of, the basic uh, forming something into a shape that you can kick uh, and then kicking it to each other, naming it a target or a goal, just seems to be a human instinct right across the world. Um, the earliest documentary evidence that we have in Scotland for football appears to be from 1424 when King James I's Parliament uh, heavily suggested, should we say, um, that uh, that people take up archery instead of football because there was no military advantage to playing football. Uh, and also there was comment at that stage about violence and danger associated uh, with football. And incidentally, at that point, the term really referred for everything from football, rugby, handball, just basically anything that, that involved um, a ball and, and wasn't on a horse, basically. Um, and at this point, of course, there were no codified rules. 
And a good example of this is the border balls, which some of you may be familiar with if you're in that kind of border country. The aim of these was simply to get the ball from one end of the town to the other. Uh, and I've got loads of family photos of this. I've mentioned before that I have uh, a lot of family connections to the Scottish borders. And um, I've got loads of photos of, of this, uh, which could be quite raucous and uh, quite dangerous. And I believe that there is a part of the border between Scotland and England which was fought over every year by a, a ball game. And tradition said that whoever uh, won the game, the, the land moved to that side. And apparently, uh, as Coldstream grew to have uh, a bigger population than Wark on the other side of the border, they kept winning. And so eventually that part of land um, ended up being part of Scotland permanently. And for a, lot, a long time, uh, football was frowned upon by various people. So by the church, because it was often played on a Sunday, by Parliament, who voted on several occasions uh, to ban football, and by businesses who were concerned about the violent nature of the game and the fact that workers would be injured and therefore not able to come to work. But none of these things seems to have much effect on the general population who continued uh, to play football, both men and women. And despite being so widely played for such a long time, it didn't become a cohesive game until the 19th century, which I find really, really interesting. And it's the same with many other things. For instance, um, like spelling didn't become standardised until far later than you might expect. There were regional variations, there were um, differences, and that's all to do with communication, transport and so on, all plays its part in standardising something. The Cambridge rules were established for football uh, in England in 1848, and then there were subsequent rules 1863. And so from then on, we see the gradual spread of a standard form of football first via the, the universities and then via uh, local clubs setting up. And of course, with this came the increased desire for formal matches. And so the first officially recognised international match was played between Scotland and England in 1872. The Scottish FA was founded in March 1873 by eight amateur clubs with the aim of coordinating fixtures. And then the first official competition in Scotland, the Scottish Cup, uh, also took place that year. The Scottish Football Association was formed uh, in 1890 and then players became professional three years later, around about three years later. So from that long, long history of the game, it's really only um, uh, in, the, in the late 1800s that, that we see it coming together as a cohesive game. And incidentally, women are recorded for playing as long as men. And there were women's teams formed at this time as well. And indeed, most most towns had a women's team it was very very popular and the first recorded women's match was in 1881 at, at Easter Road in Edinburgh um, and the popularity grew through the 20th century but even from the beginning uh, the women's teams were often met with contempt and um, with sexism and and one of the things that caused a huge so the major setback for the women's game was the banning uh, of women playing in FA grounds in, in 1921 in England and then a bit later in Scotland and it took a huge amount of time for that um, that that damage to, to be overcome and start the recovery process of the women's game. In Caithness, uh, organised football came in in about the 1880s and Wick Rovers were formed in the 1887-1888 uh, season and they became the first football association club uh, in the north of Scotland and there were village teams uh, already in existence prior to that but they became the first association club. So where does Sinclair Mackay uh, come into this, Mr Football? come into this story. Well, he was born uh, in the late 1800s, just as football was really beginning to take off in Caithness and, and around the country. He began his career as a clerk on the railways, then went on to work at the Wick Exchange of the Ministry of Labour. He served with the Royal Artillery in World War I and volunteered uh, in World War II. But most of uh, his career was spent in the Inland Revenue Office. Most of his working life spent there until he retired in 1957. Um, but we're not focusing on his, his career uh, at all in this. We're talking about what he did in his spare time. And what he did in his spare time was dedicate hours and hours and hours to his local community. Uh, various causes, various local uh, charities and so on. But mostly his focus was on sport and especially on football. And he's uh, what we call a Wheel Kent face uh, in the sporting communities of, of the north of Scotland. He was the secretary of uh, Wick Groats for around 40 years. He did everything he could to promote the success of the Groats, but he also did everything he could to promote football uh, generally in Caithness. 
He was a founder member of the Wick Juvenile Association and generally a huge promoter of football to the young. And I think, I think we all know somebody like this, um, centre of the community, working tirelessly behind the scenes to to promote whatever it is that, that, that they're passionate about and to promote uh, their, to work with their community. Um, and one thing I was thinking, if, if you know anyone like that, do tag them uh, in this chat because it would be, I think, lovely for them to know that, that they're thought of in that way. Um, one person I think of who I very sadly never had the chance to meet is my partner's grandpa, uh, George McGinn, who was exactly a character like this. As I was looking through the Sinclair Mackay collection, I was thinking about him and thinking, those people, uh, you know, he again was hugely important to, to young people's football and uh, encouraging the game and um, encouraging a passion for the game amongst people. And we all know somebody like that. And these people are so important in our communities. So as I said, uh, Sinclair Mackay was the secretary of the Wick Groats. He was also a founder member of the Juvenile Association. He was also the secretary of the Harmsworth, Par Harmsworth Park Improvements Committee Secretary of the Caithness Football Association, Secretary of the Wick Football Association, Member of the Riverside and Town Improvements Committee and Convener of the Gala Sports Committee. So you can just see the huge amount uh, of involvement he had in his community. I'm going to look at some of the documents that are held in this collection. I'm going to start by looking at documents relating to Harmsworth Park Improvements Committee. Harmsworth Park, as I said, is a sports ground in Wick. It sits between Harrow Hill and South Road on the outskirts of Wick as you approach uh, the town from the south. It's only been called Harmsworth Park since about 19, uh, since 1920. It was previously known as Harrow Park. Uh, the reason for the change in name, uh, I'll come on to in a second, but it had been a sports ground before 1920. It had already been a sports ground for decades. Uh, football and cricket had been played there. And the name change came about in 1920 after the local MP, Sir Lester Harmsworth, who was MP for Caithness from uh, 1900 to 1918, and then the MP for Caithness and Sutherland from 1918 to 1922. Uh, he bought the park for £400 and gifted it to the people of Wick for recreational purposes. The Borough Council were made trustees and the Harmsworth Park Improvement Committee was formed by representatives of local sports clubs. Sinclair Mackay was the secretary and the collection relating to this includes the minutes from its inception in 1920. And the minutes reveal a, a range of community groups that used the ground and what a strong focus they had from the very earliest days on raising money to develop and improve the land's potential. And I wanted to read some extracts to you from the minutes. So 8th of July 1920, the first meeting of the Harmsworth Recreational Park Committee was held in the committee rooms of the Comrades of the Great War Wick branch. Representatives were there from the Football Association, the Cricket Association and the Comrades of the Great War. The most pressing issue discussed was the need for drainage in the park. At subsequent meetings, financial aid was sought from Mr Harmsworth and D. Hamilton of Patagonia so that the work could go ahead. And here's some extracts. 1920, uh, 21st of January 1921, a donation of £80, £8.40 to go to the Comrades Club Wick from the local welfare committee, UFS, USF, was warmly welcomed as it would make a real difference to any upcoming renovations. A new fence around the park was a priority. 22nd of April 1921, Sea Company, the 5th Seaforth Highlanders, applied to use the park for drills. Agricultural Society hired the park for their annual show on the 5th of August for £10. Boys Brigade to use the park on Wednesday nights for sports, unless a football match is on. The park was advertised for grazing for summer season to generate income. 23rd of May 1921, park let for summer grazing for £16. Wick High School par uh, hire park for school sports. Wick Cricket Association apply to use the park on nights of the week bar Wednesday. So you get that sense of, of immediately how central uh, the ground was to the community. But by 1923, they hadn't really made much uh, progress on those improvements that they were hoping to do, especially the drainage, which, which continued to be an issue. And if anyone watching in Wick is familiar with the ground, you can tell me if that's uh, still an issue. But I hope not, judging on something that I've read. Um, and so there was a huge fundraising, fundraising push at this point. And a fundraising uh, committee was set up, which met every week to plan events. Now, it's a bit of a story of committees this week. Um, 
The fundraising committee also had subsections like the pricing committee and my absolutely favourite named committee of all time, the cake, candy and concert committee, which I'm happy to convene if anyone wants to join me. Um, they planned a huge range of activities to raise money for the park and some of them are expected. So there's things like flag days where they would go around with collecting tins, concerts, uh, jumble sales, charity football matches, uh, flower shows, beauty contests, gymkhanas, things like that. And in uh, June 1923, the Cake and Candy Committee um, had a sale, a cake and candy sale that raised £57, one shilling and sixpence profit. And what's interesting about that one is on that occasion, the Wick Fish Curers offered kippers for sale uh, to raise money. But after some dis discussion, the Fish Curers said, well, we'll sell them ourselves and then donate the money to you rather than you taking um, hot, smelly kippers into an indoor summer cake sale. Some of the fundraising events are a little bit less standard uh, and you can see the huge impact this would have had, not only raising money for, for the cause, but also just as a huge amount of community fun and entertainment. So for instance, there was a September Café Chantant, which apparently was the singing cafe or the outdoor cafe with music. There was uh, the flannel dance, which was a less formal code than a, a normal dress. Uh, less formal dress code than a normal dance. There was the fancy dress cycle parade, which we should definitely bring back. Um, and these fundraisers enabled improvements to happen, including finally solving that drainage issue. And another fabulous sounding fundraising uh, event were the winter carnivals. And we hold the records for these from 1923 to 1939. And I wanted to read to you a description that was written by my colleague Valerie, who I have certainly mentioned before, who is um, a, a font of all knowledge on, on all things Caithness. Um, and I wanted to read this to you because it just sounds marvellous. The committee booked the Rifle Hall for Christmas week, as well as New, New Year's night for the first winter carnival. They discussed ideas for stalls and entertainments and came up with a host of ideas, some familiar, some not. They included hoopla, coconut shies, fish pond, Brand tubs, black and white, the Derby, human target, sweet la, bunty pools, uh, bunty pools the strings, Aunt Sally, bucket ball, listening in, deck coits, f false faces, goldfish, toffee stall, wheel of fortune, hot plate, monkey on a stick, rubber pistol, an orchestra, balloons, and electrified water in a bucket. I'm not sure what that is. It sounds incredibly dangerous. Um, and they planned entertainment and a dance for children, a dancing competition for adults, a fancy dress ball, uh, a football match for married versus single men on New Year's Day. Uh, and th the the records list the events that actually did uh, take place. And they are sadly the electrified bucket in a wa in the uh, electrified water in the bucket didn't happen. Um, one can only assume there was some sort of risk assessment done. Um, but it does sound absolutely marvellous. And the Northern Ensign of the 2nd of January 1924 eh, recorded the success of the event. Apart from the two picture houses, the chief local attraction is the Carnival, organised by the Harmsworth Park Committee, which is being held in the Rifle Hall. This is a welcome feature as it's many years since there's been a carnival in Wick. The carnival opened on Christmas night and will be continued until New Year's night. The attractions include an electric railway, a real wireless listening in set, Aunt Sally, hoopla, shooting, a mechanical duck pond, etc. There has been a gratifying attendance by the general public and it is hoped that by this means to raise a substantial sum in the aid of park improvements. Fab, I'm seeing your message, Angus. Lovely to have you uh, with us. So those um, winter carnivals were a huge success and they raised uh, a lot of money. And so in 1925, the committee decided to erect a pavilion in the grounds of the park for club players and officials. And the committee accounts show that it cost £191, one shilling and sixpence. And it opened in 1926 and is still in use today. Now, I've mentioned the Johnson Collection before in these talks. And um, the Johnson Collection is a collection of 50,000 photographs around about from the, 19, from the 1860s to the 1970s, taken by three generations of the Johnson family. Now, these are held by the Wick Society and are digitised. They're all online at Wick, uh, johnsoncollection.net. And there's a huge range of photographs on there, and I would encourage you to have a look at them. But one is in there, which uh, is believed to be the opening 
the, the, the photograph of the opening ceremony of that pavilion. Before we move on, um, I wanted to share one last entry from the Harmsworth Park Improvement Committee uh, records because I just, I just like it, it sounds marvellous. It's a record of a benefit football match that was held to raise money for the fabulously named Flo Dixie. She was the proprietress of La Scala Picture House and the Music Hall, huge supporter of uh, sports in Wick, and apparently Scotland's premier male impersonator. And she was leaving Wick, and so they organised a charity uh, football match to raise money for her leaving. I'm going to pause for just two seconds to remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But as I say, if you're able to donate towards our work, then we very much appreciate that. So Sinclair Mackay was also secretary of the Caithness Football Association and its minutes uh, are also in this collection. And the minutes include office bearers and uh, rules, which uh, the office bearers included a representative of each, of each club on the committee. And they also contain match reports supplied to Sinclair Mackay after each game, like this example uh, from 1936. 31st of August 1936. The secretary submitted the report he received from D. Stewart, referee of the Groats Brora Miller Cup game. The report stated that the captain of the Groats team lodged a protest against the two fullbacks of the Brora team on the grounds that they were not Brora players and were not and were, according to rule, not eligible to play for Brora. Also, that according to instructions received before the game, he arranged for extra time to be played when the game ended in a draw, but the captain of the Brora team refused to play the extra time, stating that he was not advised by his club before the game. The report also stated that it proved later that the game would have to be stopped anyway owing to darkness as both teams were late turning up and turning out to start. The members took exception to the latter part of the report and contended that this was no excuse for the extra time not to be played. 17th of October 1936, a letter was submitted from the Groats FC complaining that the, of the action of one of the gatekeepers at the recent Groats Brora Miller Cup game. It's always the same ones. The complaint was to the effect that two spectators were allowed into the park who were the worse for drink, and that after the game it became common knowledge in the town that these two men did not pay for admission, but instead gave the gatekeeper a bottle of beer. Mr Moore intimated that he was the gatekeeper referred to, and explained that the two men, when they turned up at the gate, had no money, and he gave them the price of admission. One of them handed him a bottle of beer when passing by. They did not appear to be worse for drink uh, when they passed in and the members were satisfied with his explanation of the incident. Inc interesting there about the game having to be called off because there are no floodlights and we see that uh, because it was dark and of course there were no floodlights at the time and we see that through various entries, those things that um, you know we take for granted uh, today in, in the games. The Caithness Football Association doc documents also include uh, player registration forms for a wide range of clubs. And they include names and signatures of players from 1947 to, 40, uh, to 57, which would be an interesting family history resource if you know that you have family members who played football. And I thought it might be a bit of, it, uh, of interest to share a little bit of background about just a couple of those clubs that are represented in this collection. So, for instance, um, Leibster Portland FC was formed in 1887. It was named for the Duke of Portland, uh, who was the owner of the Leibster estate. And they played at Black Park, which um, some of you may now may know is now the golf uh, the golf course. But when that land was needed for the golf course, they were moved to a badly sloping site. There was a new pitch uh, laid for them in 1947, and in 1949 they joined the county league. 1952, uh, I'm sure Angus Mackay will know this, and maybe some of the others will will already know this. Um, in 1952, there were seven brothers playing for Leibster Portland. Stanley, David, Sandy, Bill, Eric, Robert and Jim Larnach all played for Leibster Portland at the same time and their father, father Magnus, was a club official, which uh, is a huge, uh, a huge uh, achievement. They won the County League on several occasions in the 1950s and one Leibster man, Dr William Alexander uh, Mackay, was a founder of Spain's first football club. Again, if you've heard my Gaelic, my, my Spanish is not going to be much better, but Recreativo do Huelva, I, I would guess, uh, in Andalusia, in 1889. And that connection between the two clubs is still marked to this day. 
Another team represented in these collections is Wick Academy. These were founded, uh, the team was founded in 1893 and they are the team that now play at Harmsworth Park as the Groats, Thistle and Rovers play at Upper Bignall Park. They joined the Highland League in 1994, which was a big year for football in Scotland. That was also the year that Caledonian and Inverness Thistle amalgamated to become Inverness Caledonian Thistle, and along with Ross County, joined the Scottish Football League. In May 1934, Wick Academy became the first foot Scottish football team to travel by air to a match, and the Dundee Courier recorded it like this. Team takes to the air. Today, Wick Academy 11 will be the first team in Britain to fly to a match by air when they will cross the Pentland Firth to Kirkwall, the capital of the Orkneys. The Wick party of 14 will cross in two batches of seven. The crossing will occupy only 25 minutes, as against nine or ten hours by road and sea. The whole operation will be completed in 80 minutes and will enable the team to arrive free from the pangs of seasickness. The Kirkwall team, which has hitherto been isolated from mainland football, will be enabled to conclude fixtures with the Northern Scottish clubs. This has hitherto been rendered impossible by the slowness of the sea route and the heavy expenses of remaining overnight. The Highland Airways line now makes it possible for the Kirkwall team to visit Inverness, play and return in the same day. And again, it's one of those things like floodlights that we just so much take for granted, uh, that, that ability to travel quickly. The final team I'm, I'm going to um, do a little bit of a focus on that, that appears in this collection is the Wick John O'Groats Football Club, uh, the Wick Groats. Founded in 1893, they replaced the Wick Rovers in the Senior League in 1895-96 season and Sinclair Mackay was an integral part of this club structure from around about 1920 right up until his death nearly 40 years later. And as I say, Angus, you will be familiar with, with people like this who are just so so key to the running of uh, of a club or an organisation. Minutes for this club show uh, that most things that were discussed, it says there are lengthy discussions or considerable debate on every subject. Here's an example, uh, two linked examples from 1902 and 1927. 5th of September 1902, Wick John O'Groats Football Club. The meeting having unanimously decided to get a new set of jerseys and pants for the first 11, considerable discussion took place as to what colour they should be. On the motion of the secretary, finally it was agreed to have maroon jerseys and white pants. The colour of the kit was a serious business, as the meeting in August 1927 goes on that there was a meeting called specifically in 1927 to discuss what colour new kit should be. As there was a Mr J.M. Swanson, who'd been a former player in the team, uh, who was now living in London, who wanted to donate a full team kit. It was decided to have red jerseys with neither too light nor too dark a shade and to have black stockings with red tops and it was agreed that if Mr Swanson wished to send on a goalkeeper sweater as well that the green, a green coloured one would be preferable. I wanted to, to finish uh, and I will run over a couple of minutes I'm sorry um, but I wanted to finish by touching on two other bodies that Sinclair Mackay was uh, a key person for. The Wick Gala Sports Committee and the Wick Football Association. Sinclair Mackay was secretary of the Wick Football Association and we hold uh, minutes, files, papers, financial information and so on from 1926 to 1948. And I wanted to draw particular attention to the work of that organisation and to the work of Sinclair Mackay during World War II because we've talked, or I, I have talked, I forget you're, you may be talking back to me but I don't know, um, a lot about the ability of sports and football to generate that community feeling and um, to raise morale and, and pull a community together. And we can really see this through the work of the Wick Football Association in World War II. So during the war, fundraising matches were held between Wick citizens and visiting military personnel. There were a lot of local youngsters who were excited at the possibility and keen to learn from the army teams who would have been much more regular players. And then for Warship Week in May 1942, there was a huge fundraising push in Caithness, as there was, as there was in, in across the country, to raise money for your local warship. And in Caithness, they were raising money for HMS Campbell, which was named after the Thurso, Thurso man Major, Jack, uh, Major Jock Campbell. 
and they had dances and concerts and parades and processions and so on. And they had an international football match, an international football match between Scotland and England, which drew 2,000 spectators. And you can imagine how, how good that would have been for morale at the time. Sinclair Mackay also organised a, a series of other matches for evening entertainment and including a whole tournament of teams that included, and I'll have to read these to you to make sure I get them right, he, he wrote to every organisation and managed to get a team from an RAF select team, 302 anti-aircraft battery, the Pioneers, 152 field ambulance, 307 coastal battery, the 9th Seaforths, the 30th Seaforths and a civilian team and they played uh, a full tournament. And correspondence from this collection reveals that inclusion in these football matches was even more widespread than that because a team was made up from the prisoner of war camp at Watton. This extract reads, a letter dated uh, 13th of January 1947 reads, at a recent meeting of the Wick Football Association a suggestion was made that a friendly game be played between the select teams from the four clubs in membership of the association and a Polish team. Our team would be selected from the three civilian teams in Wick and the prisoner of war team Watton, who have been admitted as a member of the association, and we would like to play a Polish team selected from all units in the county. The date suggested was Saturday the 25th of January. Just really interesting to see that ability of sport to to communicate and to reach out to uh, a range of people. Finally, uh, I'm going to do a little, little bit on the WIC Gala, which uh, is held in the last week of July, so it's very timely. Um, WIC Gala have been held from 1937 onwards, although there have been some gaps. And it's an annual week-long event at the end of July. It includes all sorts of different events, a fancy dress procession led by the that year's gala queen, Pipers, floats, bonfires, fireworks, uh, and so on. It was traditionally linked to the herring industry that we've spoken so much about over the course of uh, the last 69 of these talks. Um, and the gala queen traditionally was the herring queen. She needed to have uh, at least one parent involved in the herring industry. And Sinclair Mackay was, again, fundamental to this, uh, the running of this. He was the convener of the Wick Gala Sports Committee and a member of the Riverside and Town Improvements Committee. I think I hope you can you can see what I've kind of la the point I've kind of laboured through this that Sinclair Mackay and the bodies that he was involved with had a huge impact on morale, fitness, and community spirit in Caithness, both in the war and in peacetime. He died suddenly in 1959 at Harmsworth Park. He had gone there to help prepare for a match, and his funeral in Wick was very largely attended. The, the Wick Groats members of the Wick Groats. Uh, players carried the coffin and the minister said in the eulogy that he would not be remembered as an old man but a man who was young at heart and I think he died leaving a legacy and I think that is all any of us can can hope for he left an impact on his community um, in the same way that I, I mentioned George McGinn and there are other people like that that you will all know who their legacy lives on far beyond them and that's um, I think is all we can all wish for. I hope you've enjoyed this week uh, looking a little bit about at some of the football records uh, that we hold. Thank you for joining me. Next week we'll be on another sport. Next week we'll be looking at that most Scottish of sports, uh, Shinty, in our collections. So I hope you can join me then for, for next week's. In the meantime, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, there's a link to be able to do so in the film. And we're very grateful for that. And as I say, if you happen to have uh, documents, photographs, records in your loft, attic, shed, wherever, that you think it would be beneficial to come into our collections and be preserved, then please do contact us. We um, very much treasure all the records that are donated to us. Thank you very much and we'll see you next week.